we gather for worship this afternoon, please take your Psalter. Turn to Psalter 62a. 62a. My soul finds rest in God alone. Good Lord's Day afternoon to all of you as we gather for worship on the Lord's Day. And a warm welcome to you who are visiting with us this afternoon. And we pray you're blessed here with us as we worship our God and close out the Lord's Day, singing his praise and hearing him speak to us through his word read and preached. Let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves for worship with silent prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please stand, hear your God call you to worship. In the words of David in 1 Chronicles 29, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. And in your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Let's bow our heads before our God this afternoon. Almighty God, we come with David. We bless your great and awesome name. We praise you, Jehovah God. Lord, since David praised you in this way, not one part of this praise has changed. Not one part is to be omitted by us, for all of it still applies to you. All of it still describes your glory and your majesty, your power and your dominion. Lord, you are still worthy to receive praise, the praise of your people. All is yours, O Lord. All is under your domain. All owe you obedience. All owe you worship. We thank you for calling us out from among the peoples, calling us savingly out of the world so we could live as you created us to live. Thank you for taking us out of darkness into your light by your Son, Jesus Christ, and making us children of the Most High God. So we gather, Lord, with thankfulness, with a, with a desire to worship you, to bless you. We gather to praise you, to thank you for the salvation that you've given us. We desire to meet with you and be in your presence by your Holy Spirit your special presence here in worship. Thank you for gathering us together again this afternoon. And to you, O God, be the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God again. Psalter 34a. Psalter 34a. seated. Turn in your red hymnal to hymn 276. Hymn 276, Up from the Grave He Arose.
Let's confess our faith together this afternoon using the Westminster Confession of Faith. Turn, to pay, turn in the back of the hymnal to page 853. Page 853 to the chapter of Christ the Mediator. And we'll confess our faith using paragraphs 4 and 5. At the beginning of paragraph 4, it talks about this office, and it's referring to the office of mediator <coughs> that Christ took on. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do we believe concerning Christ the mediator? This office the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake which that he might discharge, he was made under the law and did perfectly fulfill it, endured most grievous torments immediately in his soul and most painful sufferings in his body, was crucified and died, was buried and remained under the power of death, yet saw no corruption. On the third day, he rose from the dead, and with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. The Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience, and sacrifice of himself, which he, through the eternal spirit, once offered up unto God, hath fully satisfied the justice of his Father, and purchased not only reconciliation, but an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. Amen. wonderful summary of our hope, not just to be reconciled to God, but to have an inheritance that is awaiting us in glory and a place to dwell with our God forever. Well, we come this afternoon to our time of intercess intercessory prayer. Um, uh, two, really one item to mention. Uh, this week is, uh, this week on Zoom, again, unfortunately. Uh, are uh, the meetings of the Canadian Presbytery of the, of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. Um, and uh, this will be three days of meetings, actually, three part, parts of three days, I should say, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday all day, and Friday morning. Um, and so uh, I'll be participating in those along with your elders uh, this week. And so pray for these meetings. It's been um, a year and a half, I think, since our, this is now the third meeting by Zoom. So... Um, and it's hard because you're not seeing men face to face. You're not able to have some of the similar interactions. If any of you have done meetings on Zoom, you know exactly what this is. Uh, and so it's hard and dealing with, with different things. We, we're going to hear uh, two student sermons. Um, we're going to examine two, two, one student and one minister is transferring in. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and then dealing with a number of other issues and hearing reports on our prison pastors and from our mission congregations and. Um, I think we'll be giving a report as well. It, the, the East Coast congregations are giving brief reports on what the work the Lord's doing. And so there's, 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 much to be, uh, there's much to be done. And pray for the meetings, pray for unity, pray for communication, um, and pray that we will actually be able to host the meetings in person this fall. So we're, we're slated. We were supposed to host them last September, but uh, we got pushed back a year. So pray that... Uh, this September, we'll have the privilege of hosting the Canadian Presbytery and, and enjoying fellowship. And um, so just lots of thoughts to, to pray for. And uh, with our brothers and sisters in Ontario uh, entering another lockdown, um, that, uh, you know, there's some added struggles. And, and so let's pray for our churches in the Presbytery uh, as well. Um, and I think that uh, there's some other, item, number, other items we'll pray for. Um, but I just wanted to mention that particular item uh, for your prayers and commend that to you this week. Let's bow our heads before our God now and praise his name and seek his grace. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you. We 
praise you, for you are near to us, and your wondrous deeds are all around us. Our souls bless your name, O Lord. Everything that is within us blesses your holy name. We, Lord, are reminded of your great benefits, and Lord, it stirs us to praise and to thank you. Even as we look back on this week and we're reminded of how you care for us and love us, we think, about, think, as we did this morning, on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're especially reminded of the greatest reason we have for praise, the salvation that we have because of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord. It is good to praise you. It is good and pleasant, and it is, be, it is fitting for us as your people to sing your praise. It's good, good to give thanks to your name, O Lord, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We extol you, our God and King, and we will bless your name forever and ever. Every day we commit ourselves to praising you, to giving thanks to you, and we commit ourselves to pouring forth the fame of your abundant goodness and to sing aloud of your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather and worship and to do just that and, and to fulfill this commitment here as we praise you. Uh, here, Lord, in, in fellowship together, in unity in Christ, we praise you. Uh, we praise you, we sing your praises with one another and to one another. We speak in our times after of, of your faithfulness in our lives and help us to go forth through our week singing your praise, praising you, whatever comes our way, whatever might happen. Lord, help us to sing and praise your name. Lord, in trouble, in trial, or in triumph, help us, Lord, to sing and praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you show to us each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that you uh, minister to us. And so we thank you that... We each and every day have the privilege of opening this word and opening the scriptures and reading them. We thank you for the privilege we have of always uh, coming, being able to come near to you in prayer. We thank you that we can enjoy these things uh, in our private worship time and in our family worship time, and we can enjoy these things especially in public worship. And we thank you that in public worship as well, Lord, we, we hear the word read, but we also hear it preached, and we are able to participate in the sacraments. And Lord, in each of these ways, you minister to us, you strengthen us. Lord, we're able to uh, see the work of the church and the carrying out of discipline, informally and formally. And this, too, is a way that, that whereby you minister to your church and care for your church and bless us. Lord, we thank you for these various means of grace. We thank you, Lord, for your continual care and upholding us as the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that uh, in the coming weeks we'll be able to... Um, begin the Sunday school program. We thank you, Lord, for that as well as, as a means by which we, uh, our, our children can be further instructed in the word and taught your truth, whether in the Lord's Prayer or uh, the summary of doctrine that's found in our shorter catechism. We thank you, Lord, for all those who are participating in that, for those who will be teaching and helping, uh, for uh, those who have been involved already to this point in the planning. And we pray that you would help things, uh, that you would give the grace uh, needed for each of those involved and that the, uh, the work done, Lord, would be, uh, would be for your glory. That we would also see fruit, that you would give, be gracious to give encouragement to the teachers and to, uh, and, to our, and to us as parents and as a congregation to see your work through this means. Lord, we thank you that the work of the church is, uh, you're blessing the work locally, and that as we come to our presbytery meetings and give a report on the work of the church here, that we're able to speak of how you're wor at work and building the church and, and in strengthening your people and, and binding us together in unity in Christ. And we thank you that we have much reason to give thanks to you for the local church and the work here at Covenanters. We pray for the regional church. We pray for the presbytery. Uh, we pray for the elders as we gather together this week, as we meet. Uh, we pray that you would minimize uh, the, the uh, annoyance of Zoom or the, the, uh, the challenge that that can be to communicate and to speak clearly and well. And we're not able to gather together, but we're all separated and each in our own places. We pray that you would bless the meetings nonetheless, that you're, for we need your presence, whether we're together or not. We need your, we need your presence to be among us. We need your spirit to guide, uh, to help, to give wisdom to make faithful decisions, and, Lord, to be bound in unity. We pray that you'd bless us then. Bless uh, the elders here and me as we participate, and bless each one as each one in our presbytery. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Ontario as they face another lockdown, and uh, worship uh, is curtailed as well. We thank you that, the, the, that they're able to gather in larger numbers than previously, but we do pray that, uh, that you would give them uh, you would help them to navigate through this, help the elders to shepherd the sheep well and, and care for your church, we pray. We 
pray for those in other parts of our country that cannot gather for worship, such as in, in British Columbia, where this has been restricted for months uh, and, and closed, where churches have been closed effectively for months. And we, we pray for, uh, for grace. We pray for our civil government that better understands the, the purpose and the need for worship. And we pray that uh, you would give patience and grace to your church. Lord, we pray for the presbytery as we have the privilege this week of hearing uh, preaching. Bless that. I mean, that, that be a blessing. And we pray for, this, for Tim Collins as he prepares for his oral examination uh, as a student. Uh, we pray that you would prepare him, help him to do well, prepare a place for him to serve in your church. We pray for Kurt Van Dyken, who will be tra- hoping to transfer in, along with his congregation, into the presbytery. And we pray that his examination would go well, that you would help him to recall uh, and articulate truth well and to uh, give a, a good testimony of your gospel and, uh, and, and the uh, truth of your word. Lord, we pray for, uh, in particular this afternoon, for our congregation in Moncton. We thank you for Mount Zion. We thank you for Pastor Yotnan and, and for the elders there. We pray for your blessing upon them, and we thank you, Lord, for blessing their worship, for gathering them uh, in worship that they're able to consistently attend. We thank you that their shutdowns have been minimal as well, and and we pray that would continue. We pray that you would bless each of the families there, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, give comfort, those who are uh, going through very deep trials. Lord, we pray for grace and strength. Uh, We pray uh, you know the details, the ins and outs of the different needs, and we, we pray that they would know your nearness and your faithfulness. We pray for a blessing on them as they also, as the elders, as they minister to the congregation in Woodstock, New Brunswick, that you would help them to balance that responsibility and care for that congregation faithfully as well. We pray for the preaching of the word, that it would reach into the Moncton community, that many would come to Christ, many would come to a stronger knowledge of Christ, and that you would bless that church with good spiritual growth. Lord, we pray for Our outreach as a congregation, whether in our community, at work, and in invitations that go out to worship, or the opportunities we have to share the gospel, to speak with others, to answer questions, to encourage others in the name of Christ, help us to take those opportunities, give us words to speak, give us confidence in the Spirit to use even the most stumbling speech to make a difference in the heart of, uh, of whoever we're talking to. We pray for our outreach online. We pray for those who watch our services online. Uh, We pray, Lord, that you would bless each one. Um, We pray, Lord, for those who are not able to be here for whatever reason. Uh, And we pray for those who are not able to be in a local church for whatever reason at this time. We pray for a blessing upon them. We pray for for Susan and Harold Mahler, and we thank you for their connection all the way from Vancouver Island. We pray for them as they long to be in a local church. Um, which is only exasperated by the, sh- the churches being shut down. We do pray that you would provide uh, for them, give them patience, give them trust in you, give them wisdom, and uh, that you would guide them as they look for a church and, and uh, perhaps can even consider relocating to be able to be near a faithful church and participating in the life of a church. Thank you for their heart for that, and bless them, provide for them, and may we continue to be a blessing uh, from this coast uh, over to them. Uh, we pray for uh, Sarah and uh, we pray for Dylan as they watch their services as well and, and for others who are watching online and who may even just come across the sermons uh, through the week. Lord, we pray, may this uh, be a blessing for your kingdom and for your, your people uh, near and far. We pray, Lord, for our students as the, as, uh, especially our post-secondary students as, as semesters come to an end as uh, exams and final projects loom, uh, we pray give them grace and strength. Thank you for the Lord's Day. We're able to take a break and, and refresh and remember what's most important. But we pray as they look ahead to another week and as they, as, um, as they look ahead to, to what might be coming, we pray that they would trust you. We pray that you would strengthen them, help them, give them all that they need, help them to recall what they've studied, help them to do their work well as to the Lord and not for men, that they would serve you well and glorify your name. We pray give wisdom and give help for all those, again, who are graduating this year and looking ahead, wondering what the future holds. We pray they would trust in you who holds the future. We pray for our community, Lord. We pray for grace in our community. As we look around us, we see lots of fear. We see lots of unknowns. Think of the COVID and variants and all these other things that can uh, stir up fear. 
Lord, the uncertainty of vaccinations, though we, we do thank you for the, the blessing of medicine and the, and the blessing of these vaccinations, but even uncertainty about their, um, uh, about their effectiveness or their uh, troubles that may come. Lord, help us, help us to be wise about these things. Help us to make wise decisions for our own families, our own health. Lord, give us not to trust in these things, but to trust in you. And so even when we use the means of medicine that you give us, help our hope and our trust to be in you ultimately knowing, Lord, that you are gracious and merciful, and that we need your blessing even upon any medical intervention that we use. Lord, we thank you that we can turn to you and recognize, Lord, that our hope is not in this life as, as it is, but it's in the life that we can have in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. As we consider your word now in these next moments, as we hear this familiar uh, statement of Christ and consider it in its context and and uh, and consider it in, the, in, uh, in light of uh, celebrating this day, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless it to our hearts. Comfort us by it and help us to be a comfort to others using these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for our Savior, risen, reigning, and ever living to make intercession for us at your throne of grace. Lord, it's through Christ that we come and we lay before you all our praise, all our thanksgiving, and all our petitions. And it's through Christ that we, uh, we have expectation to, that we will hear your word and that you will bless it to our hearts in these next, uh, in the, in these next minutes. So, Lord, we pray in the, with confidence in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God, Psalter 16b. Psalter 16b, I'll bless the Lord who counsels me. be seated. Turn to the Word of God to John 11. John 11. We'll read verses 20 to 46. And I'll be preaching this afternoon on verses 25 and 26. The context, of course, is, is Lazarus uh, being sick, friend of Jesus. He's being sick and he's 
uh, actually going to die, and by the time we enter the story here, he'll have died. He'll have been laying in the grave for uh, four days already, um, and before Christ arrives and uh, and speaks with Lazarus's sister Martha. John 11, beginning at verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. When she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to find him. Now, I'm sorry, and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. And many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Have you ever wondered what to say to someone who's dying? Or perhaps, have you ever wondered how to comfort someone who has just lost someone? Has just lost a loved one or a friend? Perhaps, in those moments, you think, I don't know what to say, and maybe I'm better off saying nothing, and just wait till the awkwardness passes, and, and I'll just kind of hope things will, will move on. I won't have to say anything. Perhaps it, it, when, when you hear, as, as it seems to be more and more the case these days, and there's no visitation or no funeral, there's a sense of relief at not having to be in that sort of a situation. Death is hard. Death is hard to face. Death is hard to address. Death is hard to comfort. Even as Christians, even as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, even for yourself as you consider your own death and face your own death. It's hard. And in many ways, this is understandable. You and I were not created to die. Death is not natural, as our naturalistic world wants to explain it away. It's not natural to die. 
Oh, where is the comfort? Where is the hope that we need in the face of death? Well, Jesus Christ addresses this very question. Jesus addresses death. He not only speaks about death, but he also provides the solution to death and the real comfort in the face of death. And that is himself. He is the comfort in death. You know, as we read John 11 and we read this story, it can have a very familiar feel to it. A, a, a feeling that, that we almost get, we can relate to so much of the story. It feels familiar when we think of death and we're surrounded by death ourselves. The grief that Martha and Mary and even our Lord felt is a grief that we know all too often. And in the midst of grief, and you can know this in your own heart and life, it can be hard to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. It can be hard to remember simple gospel truths as we deal with grief and are overwhelmed. It can be hard to look to Christ. And perhaps we can also treat death and know very much. We think death is a is something we just need to avoid, like the disciples when, they, when Jesus was going to go up to visit Lazarus and, or to, to, see, to, to this, deal with the situation. Uh, they would rather have avoided the whole thing. But in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, we see the perfect example of care, the perfect example of compassion. We hear the gentle response of a Savior who cares for his people. We see the example of his tender heart. And more than an example, we here we hear the words and see the actions of Almighty God in the Lord Jesus Christ. The actions of raising Lazarus from the dead, foreshadowing his own resurrection and his giving of that resurrection life to his people. You and I can't provide comfort as Christ provided comfort. But you and I can speak to others of Christ and tell them of the comfort that he has brought and trust that he by his Holy Spirit will also minister comfort to others as we minister to them. You and I can speak the words of Christ to others, to those whose hearts are overwhelmed, to those whose, who, whose grief clouds a sight of heaven. You and I can be those who take theological truth and apply it gently and carefully and lovingly to those who need it. So what I want to do with you this afternoon is to consider these wonderful words of Christ, the comfort that he brings for you and for those around you who are without comfort. Your only comfort in the face of death is the living Christ who personally provides for your resurrection and eternal life. Your only comfort in the face of death is the living Christ who personally provides for your resurrection and eternal life. We're going to consider Christ's personal comfort at the beginning of verse 25. Then Christ personally provides for your resurrection, verse 25, the second part of verse 25, and then Christ personally provides for your eternal life, verse 26. Christ's personal comfort, and then Christ personally provides for your resurrection and for your eternal life. Well, first let's consider Christ's personal comfort. And we need to consider the, that, that Christ is, is where Christ is speaking and who he's speaking to and in what context he's speaking. I'm not going to dwell a lot in the context. I'm not going to unpack the whole narrative that before and after these words of Christ, but I'm going to bring it in where it's, where it's relevant as we're going to focus in on verses 25 and 26. We have to understand that Christ is not giving a lecture at a university. He's not having a private conversation as he did so much of his teaching with his 12 disciples. He's not speaking in the temple. He's not He's, he's not preaching a sermon. What Christ is, when he speaks these words, he's coming in the middle of a grieving, he's coming, to a, he's coming in the middle of a grief situation. He's speaking to a grieving sister, a, a, someone who's overwhelmed by grief. Now, there's nothing wrong if Christ had said these words in a lecture or at a, in a sermon. But we have to understand the context of when Christ is saying this. He's not just speaking theoretically. He's not just throwing out some big idea that has no real meaning in life. But right away, these words have application. He's speaking these words as application in the heart uh, of, of Martha. Martha was struggling in dealing with the death of her brother, especially since she knew something of the power of Christ. And her response to Christ even when he arrives, is, is somewhat disrespectful. 
And it's pretty bold. And I mean, we, we don't know, we don't hear the tone. In some ways, this text, you know, her, her words in verse uh, 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, in some ways, it's like reading an email. I mean, you don't know the tone that someone's sending it in. And so we don't read the tone in the text. But in some sense, it seems a bit disrespectful. Lord, you, you, you kind of messed up. You should have been here. We see that even then, she, she still had a cloudy understanding of the power of God. She had a cloudy understanding of uh, the power of Christ and who he is as the divine son of God. But we see Christ's response. He didn't say to her, how dare you speak to me with that tone of voice? How dare you say such a No, Christ was gentle with her grieving heart. He was kind to her. He declares to her truth slowly and gently, and he demonstrates that truth then in the raising up of her brother from the dead. But Christ is patiently instructing her about resurrection truth, about the resurrection, patiently instructing her about his own power, and his own divinity. He was not harsh. That teaches us. Christ sets here an example for how you and I ought to be in dealing with those who are grieving. We're not to be harsh with, with those who are grieving. And it's amazing. When, when people are grieving at times, you could forget basic truths. And it, you're so caught and so overwhelmed by what you're grieving that you, for, you, 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 you can forget simple gospel truths. And we need to gently remind brothers and sisters in Christ, of the wonderful truths of the gospel. We need to come alongside them and love them and care for them and be gentle with them. So pray to be like Christ. If you, as you think about grieving situations, pray now so that, you're, that, that God would prepare you to comfort others and to be gentle and kind, not frustrated and annoyed. Now Martha had a future hope. Jesus said to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha's response to him was, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She had some hope of the future and, and with, with the Jewish idea of the resurrection coming later down the road. But Christ is bringing her not a hope down the road for the future, although that is there, but it's an imminent hope, an immediate hope in himself, in him personally. So she says, I know that Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Christ is saying, you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. I am. I am the personal hope for Lazarus, for you, for all who believe in me. Now Jesus says, I am. And, and this is one of seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. Seven times where Jesus says, I am. And this I am is not just, a, it's not just the way of Jesus describing it. It, it, it's, it matters when he says, I am. This is hearkening all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 when, when God reveals himself to Moses and Moses says, what is your name? And God says, I am that which I am. Yahweh, Jehovah, I am that which I am. When Christ makes these statements, like this one, I am the resurrection and the life. He is making a declaration that I am Jehovah God. I am God. I'm not a mere man. I am God himself. And because I'm God, I'm able to comfort in a way that no man can. I'm able to give comfort in a way that no one else can. The other ways that Jesus declares, he, brought, he would bring divine hope to those he preached to. I am the bread of life. Those who eat of me will never hunger. I am the light of the world shining into the darkness. I am the door by which you enter into eternal life. I am the good shepherd who cares for his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I am the vine. All those who are in me, those who abide in me will have everlasting life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he says here, I am the resurrection and the life. R.C. Sproul summarizes this statement that Jesus makes here this way. He, he, he paraphrases it. He says, I hold the keys of life and of death. I am the foundation, the power of life itself, and I have the power to raise dead people from the grave. I don't just teach the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am the very power of God unto life. What was Jesus' response to the reality of death it was to declare his own supremacy over death itself. And it was to personally promise 
and provide the conquering of death and the hope of life that every man, woman, and child needs to hear. It's a personal provision. Not heartless, not aloof. It's personal. We see what Christ did and was doing with Martha is what he does for, each, for you and me who are trusting in him. His care for us is personal. Your only comfort in the face of death is the living Christ who personally provides for your resurrection and eternal life. We've considered the personal comfort that Christ gives. Well, now let's unpack it in terms of both the resurrection and eternal life. Understanding the claim Christ, make and then, Christ makes and then applying it to our own life. Well, Christ personally provides for your resurrection. He makes the statement, I am the resurrection. And then he says uh, at the end of verse 25, he said, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And the, re the resurrection is very simply the, the, the rising again to life from death. It's someone who, died, who, who, has, who has died physically and has becomes alive again physically. We can speak of a spiritual resurrection, which the scriptures do as well, but here we're speaking of a physical resurrection. Now, to the unbelieving world, death is final. Death is king. To the unbelieving world, once you die, that's it. We speak of a resurrection, but not literally. There's figurative resurrections, people who come back from a near-death experience, people whose careers are, uh, who, who, who are spiraling in their career, but somehow manage to, to pull their career together and, and, has, and have some sort of resurrection in their career. That's not what Jesus is speaking of. He's speaking of a real resurrection. Physical resurrection here, specifically. And he's not just promoting it, again, like Sproul says. He's not just teaching about it. He is declaring himself to be that resurrection. He is the very author of the resurrection. He is the very fountain of life. He who has made life can remake life. He who has brought man up from the dust of the ground, out of the dust of the ground once, can bring man out of the dust of the ground again. He is the one who is powerful to raise up whom he will. He's speaking to his own power as God himself. But he's also speaking, foreshadowing his own death, to conquer death, to conquer the enemy that death is. See, death came upon humanity because of sin. Genesis 2.17, In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We die because we sinned. But Christ came to conquer sin, to defeat sin. Death is powerful, and the world thinks it's all-powerful, but Christ says, no, it's not. I'm all-powerful. I have the final word. You see, Jesus Christ came as the perfect, sinless Son of God, and he died, but because he was perfect and sinless, death had no hold on him. He died, but he couldn't stay dead. And his resurrection on the third day showed that he had conquered death. He had overcome death. He had defeated it. And because he had defeated death himself, he had defeated death for his people. He can raise his people. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Christ is the first one to rise from the dead, and he is the first fruit. We, because he has been raised from the dead, we too will be raised from the dead. He is the resurrection. He defines it, he declares it, he promises it, he provides it. I am the resurrection. What is this application to you? Christ moves from declaring this statement then to outlining what this means for you who believe in Jesus Christ. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now notice the qualification. He who believes in me. It's applied to believers only. Those who are united to him by faith. Those who are united to him in his death and in his resurrection. 
He who believes in me. This is for, for you to have the hope of the resurrection, you must believe in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You need to be brought into that union with Christ. Salvation through Christ. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, Christ says here, though he may die, or if he dies. Now, this is not a, well, some might not die. This is really, he's saying, making the statement almost, there's kind of a, because he's underemphasizing it, it overemphasizes it. He's making the statement of, we were looking at saying, what do you mean, if, though he may die, we all will die. This applies to all of you. This morning, when I was, inviting you to return for worship this afternoon and listen to that, you thought, you know, it almost, it almost like, I was almost going to introduce the saying, well, there's an exclusive invitation. This invitation for worship this afternoon is only for a select group of people. If you're going to die, you should probably be here this afternoon. And all of you qualify. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. Now for the unbeliever who dies... This is an eternal dying. It's horrific passing from this life, which really is already the beginning of death, into an eternal death, into the horrific horrors of hell. And the unbeliever will be raised, but will be raised to death, will be reunited with their body and cast into the lake of fire and will, will perish in hell forever. But for the believer, death brings you to a better state. Brings you to glory, as we heard this morning with the criminal on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Death has lost its sting. Judgment has been overcome in Christ, provided for. Death doesn't, dis doesn't extinguish our hope as believers. Death doesn't have that power anymore. Jesus Christ is the resurrection. You will live again physically. You will be raised. Though he may die, he shall live. You will be raised. Your body rests in the grave until the resurrection, and then it will be reunited with the soul, and you will, you will enter into eternal glory forever, body and soul. Death does not have the final word. This was the hope given to Martha. Again, this was not just said in theory. Christ is applying this to Martha, bringing comfort to her soul. There is real hope after death for those who are believing in Jesus Christ, as Lazarus did. All of this is possible, Martha, because I promise it, and I will guarantee it, because I am God. And he demonstrated his power. He demonstrated the truth of it. He demonstrated that God the Father had sent him for this very purpose by raising Lazarus from the dead. But see, the hope that Christ was bringing to Martha was not some extra few years of life here in this world it was a life that never ends an eternal life your comfort this is comfort for you comfort this idea that christ is the resurrection this truth is comfort your comfort all must deal with death all of us must face it this is a message of hope for you to hold on to when fear wants to grab you. The fear of death, the fear of your death, the fear of anyone else dying. This is the message of hope for you to grab onto. Dwell on what is known, not, as what, not what is unknown. There's so much unknown about our death. But grab hold of what is known. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and you will be raised to new life. There is a certainty because of Christ. There is one more powerful than death. Jesus Christ. And you know it. And this is not something, you know, we, we know the truth of the resurrection. Those of us who have grown up in the church, this is, this is perhaps something that, that we, just, we just take for granted. We know this. Yes, Jesus rose from the dead, and we will rise from the dead. But sometimes that kind of, that kind of knowledge, actually, we, we know it in theory, but we don't hold it close. We don't understand, or we don't, we don't look to it for comfort and, and, and joy. This is not something just merely to be believed, but to be held close, to, to as we believe on it, to, to live according to it. And it's a truth to bring to those who are mourning, comfort to those who, when believers die, we can bring them comfort of this promise of Christ and his true words and who he is. And we can bring it as comfort for others who need Christ when they're surrounded by death. To others who need to hear these words of Christ. So when people are mourning and grieving and facing death, they say, there is one more powerful than death. Do you know 
Jesus Christ. Your only comfort in the face of death is the living Christ who personally provides for your resurrection and eternal life. I've considered the personal comfort for the resurrection, and this comes first before the state of life. But Jesus also speaks to the comfort of eternal life. We see that in verse 20, 26, mainly. Well, Jesus makes this, made this declaration, I am the resurrection and the life. And these two things are, are intertwined. They're interconnected. And it's, you can't really, it's hard to pull them apart. The one follows the other. One, you can't have resurrection without eternal life in terms, of, in terms of what Christ is speaking of here. We're kind of pulling this apart to examine each, each thing in its own part. But we need to understand these two go together. I am the resurrection and the life. And when we speak of life, again, a reminder that Jesus Christ is the very source of life. He's the root of all life. He's the creator of all life. John makes this very clear at the beginning as he opens his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus Christ is the author of life. He's also... He's not just the creator of life, he's the recreator of life. Spiritual life and physical new life that comes through the resurrection. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, truly, I make this commitment. See, Jesus Christ doesn't just have control over life, but he is the very source of life. Without Christ, we're all dead. He is the very source of life. William Hendrickson writes, The full, blessed life of God, all his glorious attributes, that's in Christ. As such, he is also the cause, source, or fountain of the believer's glorious resurrection and of their everlasting life. Because he lives, we too shall live. With him removed, nothing but death is left. Now, because of sin, physical life, simply, only physical life, holds no hope for us. Simply living in this world does not give us hope any longer. People are desperate to maintain this life Uh, with with the pandemic and other things. You see people going to extreme circumstances to to save their lives and hopefully preserve their lives. And and, and maybe, you know, if they're going to die, maybe they can freeze part of who they are and hopefully come back to life once we advance science enough to bring people back to life, apparently. I'm just thinking of Walt Disney. Uh, And and the desire to live forever. People, on one hand, agree that life is precious. Interestingly, they think their life is precious. Other lives are a little more expendable. But their lives are precious. But see, our hope is not in the fact that we have some sort of life here in this world. Our hope is not in, in, in life itself, but in Christ. Though the two go together, don't they? Our hope is in Christ. He is the life. He is the one we hope in and trust in. Not in a life that, that is somehow separated from Christ. And such hope, to have such hope in Christ, means life will never end. Your life in Christ will never, ever end. Who makes that promise? Christ does. Who is Christ to make that promise? He is the very fountain of life itself. And it is the gift that he gives you, eternal life. And again, Christ unpacks this claim in verse 26. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now he's addressing here believers' eternal life, which has, which already begins. We've seen this a bit in Colossians, where we've been already spiritually raised with Christ, and we're already living. We're already beginning our eternal life now. Eternal life is not a future reality. We begin it now. Hope for Lazarus and for his family was not just in the future, but was in the life that they had in Christ that was beginning already. Rick Phillips writes that those who believe in Christ are freed from the power of death even before they die, and they receive this never-ending life even now to live in this world as those who have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Our lives are already secure in Christ. Our eternal life is already secure. We have nothing to lose. Were you to die in this very moment, you would pass into glory. Your life would continue. Death is a passageway into the next world. Jesus says, whoever lives, 
whoever is alive in me will never die. And it's actually the strongest possible way in the Greek language to say that you will never, ever, ever, ever die. Not even the potential for death is there. Now, he's not speaking of physical death, obviously. Lazarus was dead in the grave, and he believed in Christ. But he's speaking of, a, of spiritual life. You're alive in Christ, and nothing can remove you from that life. Nothing can separate you. As Paul writes in Romans 8.38, not even death can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is hope for all God's people. Your eternity is already secure. And what Christ promises, what Christ earns, he secures. He'll never, no, never, no, never take it away from you. You are given eternal life. And Christ applied this beautifully to Martha, the hope of life surpassing death. This was the hope that Lazarus had. And her hope for Lazarus was this eternal life hope for you and me as we face death whether it comes soon or in many years it's the hope our world needs as all of us are under a death sentence and those outside of Christ are under an eternal death sentence Christ took your sentence of death on himself and in its place he gives you eternal life and his resurrection demonstrates this victory and it demonstrates the certainty of your life because I live you will live also. Paul writes to the Corinthians again in 1 Corinthians 15. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ won the great victory. Over death, he, raise, he will raise you from the dead. He will give you life everlasting that will never be taken away. Your only comfort in the face of death is the living Christ who personally provides for your resurrection and eternal life. Well, we've considered the, one, this wonderful divine declaration of Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. And he personally provides real comfort for you in the face of death. Well, the concluding question that Christ asked to Martha was, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And Martha still had some uncertainty about what Christ was saying. She still had some misunderstanding. But yet she gives this beautiful, beautiful confession of faith. Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Here, Martha, in the midst of grief, in the midst of sorrow, she believed on Christ, even if she didn't fully know the details of how the, what, everything that he was saying. But how about you? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The question that comes to you this afternoon is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? You and I have a fuller revelation, a better understanding of what Christ was saying. Martha preceded the cross. We come after the cross. We, we see what Christ had come to do. And this isn't just a belief that's merely intellectual. But believing is to lay hold of this, to find hope in this, a resting in Christ. What is faith? It's to rest in Christ and his promises, finding real hope and real comfort in them. Your faith is demonstrated by the difference these words, these promises, make in your own life. By how much words like this put away your fear of death. How much they are a source of comfort for your soul. How much they spur you on to comfort others with the comfort that God has comforted you with. Now, brothers and sisters, this doesn't mean death is easy. It doesn't mean that we should... We, we, we never fear or tremble or wonder about the unknowns. But it's a reminder that our comfort will only come in Jesus Christ. Your comfort will only be found in Christ. Is Jesus Christ your hope for eternal life already and resurrection life to come? See, the world says this is all impossible because it requires faith in the supernatural beyond the natural. It requires putting our hope outside of ourselves into God Almighty. 
It requires humility to say, I can't, I don't have all the answers, I need God. But Jesus Christ's words have been show, were, were demonstrated to be true in the raising of Lazarus and, and in Christ's own death and resurrection, especially in his death and resurrection. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let us put away vague notions of who Christ is and what he's done. Put away cold confessions of faith in the resurrection and believing that I believe these things, but they have no discernible bearing on your life. Hear this real comforting truth. Think on these promises. Pray for faith to believe them, to rest in Jesus Christ. And strive more and more to know Christ and to know the power of his resurrection. For only in Jesus Christ are such promises found. And only in Jesus Christ is such comfort able to be made true in your own life. Lord, thank you for these words of comfort. These words, Lord Jesus, that you spoke to a grieving sister. And you spoke them with such gentleness, such tenderness, such care. You spoke these real words of comfort. And in yourself, Lord, this comfort is provided. These were not empty, hollow words, but they're real words of comfort. Thank you for such an example of tenderness and care. Thank you for such an example of, of love. Thank you, Lord, for being the very provider of this comfort for not just for Martha, but for your people through the ages and for our own hearts and lives, even this afternoon. Lord, help us to believe these things. Give us the faith to lay hold of these things. They would make a discernible impact in our own life. Lord, if there are those here who are struggling with the questions of death, facing death, who are fearful, even as your people, remember your sons and your daughters. Care for them and comfort them with these words. Lord, for any here or hearing this message who do not know Christ, Lord, open their eyes to see the horrors of death without Christ, but to see, Lord, the difference that Jesus Christ makes, he who is the resurrection and the life. And Lord, give us courage, the love, the care to comfort others with these words, that even as we can bring these words to others and tell them, and have you heard of Christ, the one who is the resurrection and the life, that we do so with gentleness, with care, and with faith that you, by your Spirit, will take those words and you will apply them again every time we're able to bless another's life with them. Help us then to comfort others, not to run away from situations of un that are uncomfortable, but to enter them boldly with real words of hope, the only real hope that can be found, that which is in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this day, again to remember the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you. We thank you for him. We pray to you in him. Amen. Sing hymn 34. Hymn 34. The God of Abraham praise. We'll sing verses 1 to 5. And then after the benediction, we'll sing verse 6 as our doxology. Hymn 34.
up now and receive the blessing of God. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Thank you.